Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to At America. At America is the U.S. Embassy's American Center, and our mission is to provide a space for young Indonesians to learn more about the United States. And hello, my name is Patricia Elizabeth, and it is an honor for me to be MC for this event. I want to welcome our distinguished guests from USAID and from U.S. Embassy Jakarta, and also our audience from Universitas Pelita Harapan. Thank you. Today, we are come back to our series, Meet the U.S. Embassy, and today with USAID Mission Director, Jeff Cohen. In this episode, we're going to hear directly from our amazing speaker about his career in the foreign service and the critical role of development cooperation in international affairs. Without any further ado, I will invite the moderator and speaker to be seated on the stage. First, we have our amazing moderator. She is Economist Office of the Chief Economist USAID Washington, D.C., Olivia Wynn. <laughs> and of course, our speaker for today, Jeff Cohen, Mission Director, USAID Indonesia. Hi, everyone. How's it going? You good? We feeling good today? Okay, how many of you have been to At America before? Oh my gosh, I only see like 10 hands. Okay, well, it's my first time here as well. So welcome to you, welcome to me. Welcome, Jeff, thanks so much for being here I've today. I've been here before. Jeff has been here before. He knows the venue for very well. For jazz music, for sustainable development goals, lots of stuff. That's right. So my name is Olivia. I am an economist at USAID. Um, I'm Vietnamese-American, born and raised in New Jersey, um, and I'm here with USAID Indonesia for four months on a work rotation before I return to Washington, D.C., where I work at USAID headquarters. Jeff, do you want to say a few words of welcome? Yeah, so thank you all for coming. Salamat siang. Uh, I'm sorry I was a little bit rushed. As you know, uh, traffic in Jakarta sometimes is a problem. Yeah. Uh, but I'm glad I made it. I'm glad to be here with you all. And in true fashion of what is hip, I don't know if I'd call it hip, here in Indonesia, I'm going to start us off with a pontoon. Is everybody okay Ooh, with who likes doing pontoons. a pontoon? Woo. All right. Main ke mal di siang hari, jagan lupa datang ke at America, Ikut acara meet the U.S. Embassy. Senang sekali bertemu anda semua. Woo! Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you, Jeff. This has become a tradition recently at USAID Indonesia. Jeff likes to start off meetings with Pantun. So uh, we hope to keep the energy up today. Thank you again all for being here. We're going to start off the session with a little bit of USAID history to get you familiar with the organization and its role uh, in Indonesia. Then we're going to talk a little bit about Indonesia's um, work, USAID Indonesia's work, uh, what our focus is here, and then we're going to get to the juicy stuff about Jeff's life story and the adventures he's had uh, throughout his career um, on his way to becoming the mission director, the leader of USAID Indonesia. So make sure you have your phones ready. Make sure you have the questions coming for our Q&A session at the end of today's event. All right, so without further ado, oh, and let me also welcome our online audience. Thank you to those of you who are joining us online today. Super happy to have you here. Um, and so without further ado, let me turn it over to our e-guide to start us off with a trivia question for you all. Okay, so we're going to show the Mentimeter for the first trivia question. So student, audience, please prepare your gadget because we're going to use Mentimeter. It's similar like Kahoot. You can go through www.menti.com. You can open to any browser by your device. Go to www.menti.com or you can scan the barcode over here. I can do it too, right? Yes. <laughs> I think I know the answer. <laughs> so you can enter the code as 39080916. And if you 
directly go to our homepage, you can click the thumbs up. So while we're waiting for the audience to put in their answers, Jeff, you get to travel a lot as mission director of USAID Indonesia. Why don't you tell us about some of the cool places you've been to recently? Well, let's see. I just got back last week. I was in West Kalimantan, in Pontianak, and Singkawan. Uh, and I also went to play an island called the Mukutan, uh, which is an area, a small island off the coast where there's some local tourism going on. And it's actually one of 13 marine protected areas that USAID uh, is currently working to improve the management of. I got to do a little bit of scuba diving, got to meet the community members. Uh, I had a fantastic trip to West Kalimantan. Amazing. Has anyone here been to West Kalimantan or are you from West Kalimantan? Anyone? Okay, okay, I see a few hands, that's great. I hear it's super beautiful. Anyone here a scuba diver? Anyone here really into the ocean? I'm a diver, I'm super excited to get to know the Indonesian ocean. In well, Indonesia region. is one of the greatest places on earth to scuba dive, and so if you are brave enough, there's wonderful courses here, all PADI certified, that you can get uh, certified for diving, and I'm enjoying traveling the country, visiting USAID projects, and meeting in person some of the fish on the coral reef that we're hoping to protect. Yeah. All right, let's see. Okay, so we have around 40 people, so we can start the quiz. All right. Okay, so we have around 40 players ready for answer the questions. And the question is, When did USAID begin its partnership with Indonesia? You can choose 1983, 1950, 1961, or 1976. Choose carefully. Okay, so I think everyone has voted. The correct answer is 1961. Back ah, to you, Olivia. Very good. So 11 of you already knew. Jeff, why don't you start us off with a little bit of USAID history in Indonesia and tell us about its origins. So USAID was started by President John F. Kennedy in 1961, the same year he started the United States Peace Corps. And we can talk about Peace Corps a little bit later because I'm a former Peace Corps volunteer. We're called return Peace Corps volunteers, but I'm not living in the United States, so I'm not sure I ever returned from the Peace Corps. But so uh, USAID started in 1961. However, the US government had pr been providing development assistance around the world uh, for the decade before 1961. And specifically here in Indonesia, we started in 1950. Uh, over the course of time, Indonesia has transformed into a regional leader, uh, doing wonderful things, economic growth, empowering people, uh, becoming a democracy, and USAID has been a partner in a lot of those uh, different changes over time. Yeah, so tell us more about the people, the groups, the organizations that USAID Indonesia partners with here. So currently, uh, USAID engages in lots of different, what I, we call technical sectors. We work with the government of Indonesia. We work with non-governmental organizations. Here's a couple. We work with Bapanas, the planning ministry. We work with uh, non-governmental organizations like Indica. We work with uh, the, the, the legal aid organization, uh, media organizations. We work with universities, Indonesian universities and American universities. And we work with the private sector. Groups like AWS, Amazon Web Services, or Coca-Cola. And of course, we work with local organizations, including NGOs and civil society organizations that are out in the community. And of course, we work with large public uh, international organizations like UNICEF, FAO, and others. Uh, most importantly, though, we partner with the government of Indonesia. That's our first point of contact. Uh, I have signed a large agreement with Bapanas, and recently my boss, Samantha Power, Administrator Power, signed an agreement with Ibu Siti uh, Nurbaya Bakar, the Minister of Environment and Forestry, that's going to focus on conservation, climate change adaptation, and sustainable forestry. 
Great. And can you tell us about how much funding USAID Indonesia has every year for these programs and projects? So since 1961, there have been a lot of changes in our programming. Uh, we started doing a lot of service provision, a lot of construction, infrastructure development. But over the last two decades, we focused more on capacity building, transforming institutions, making sure democracy takes a hold here in Indonesia. We spend on average over the last 10 years $130 million, so about $1.3 billion of investment. What's interesting, though, is that we'll spend money in water and sanitation, but we'll leverage the private sector and the public sector investments in the areas where we're working. So we'll work with the government to make sure that local governments invest in things like water and sanitation solutions for their population. So while we bring resources at a billion, billion, point three uh, dollars uh, over 10 years, the government of Indonesia has manifested increased investment well above uh, what USAID brings to the table, in addition to the private sector investments that we encourage in a lot of our partnership programs. Yeah, thank you. And you know, development is such a complex process. You know, it's not a linear process, it's not black and white. So it's super important for USAID to be working across the board with so many different partners, stakeholders that have different views and perspectives to contribute to the process. So now that we have a better understanding of USAID Indonesia's history here in Indonesia, let's get a little bit more into the meat of things with a second trivia question. This one might be tougher. Okay, so students and audience, please prepare your gadget again. We go to our second questions to our menti.com. If you forget, the passcode is 39080916. Okay, we have 40 players ready. So we're going to start the question number two. The question is, which of this is a USAID project in Indonesia? You can click which of this is a USAID project in Indonesia. 10 seconds. Three, two, one. Everyone has voted? Okay, all of the above, the correct Ooh. answer. Back to you, Olivia. Thank you. All right, let's go back to the slides. And Jeff, maybe you can talk about some of these notable projects that USAID has been involved with over time. Well, I'm very encouraged that the people that got it wrong got it wrong in a very positive way because orangutan conservation is one of the you know, longstanding efforts that USAID Indonesia has been involved with, especially with the Ministry of Environment and Forestry and the brand new agreement that Samantha Power signed with Minister Siti Nurbaya Bakar covers our future programming in orangutan conservation. But this one is a good one. Does anybody know what that is? What's that? It's a toll road. What's cool about that toll road? The first one in Indonesia and where else? The first one in all of Asia, right? The first toll road. That was a USAID project back when we were doing hardcore infrastructure development. Pretty cool, right? <laughs> Who knows what this is? What does that mean in English? Family planning, who knows the song? I see some of our older members of the audience might know, remember some songs. There were a lot of famous songs back in the day when family planning was taking off in Indonesia. And when I visited BKKBN, the whole group sings along to the, the songs that were in, you know, part of the learning experience about doing family planning. Uh, what's the next one? Oh, the, of course, one of my favorites. I was just traveling with my boss to Tanjung Puting National Park with Minister Nurbaya Bakar, uh, and we got to release orangutans into the wild, into Tanjung Puting. So, of course, orangutan conservation, and our new project is going to be called Primata. This bank, BRI, is a long-standing partner that USAID helped support years and years ago in a project called Simpedes Community Savings Program in the 1980s. So a lot of the industries, banking, the, um, the stock exchange, these are organizations, entities, institutions that USAID provided a lot of technical assi assistance to when they were first getting started. What's the next one? Uh, so these are our different uh, sectors that USAID works in, and I'm gonna walk you through the four different ones. Uh, uh, so he health, of course, is our, go ahead. 
Sorry, but before we walk sure. through the, uh, the four sectors in more detail, we definitely want to understand from you all, the audience, what sectors you care the most about, and then we'll try to cater our answers and, and our description to the audience. So the EI wants to facilitate a poll. Yes, so we can show the poll from the Mentimeter, and then the audience or students can choose what issue do you care about the most. You can choose... Is it ending COVID-19 and promoting better global health? Or protecting the environment and fighting climate change? Or promoting inclusive economic growth and education? Or maybe protecting democracy and human rights and eliminating corruption? A little bit tight. Hopefully all of you care about all of these issues, of course, but you know, as you're looking to start your careers and you're looking to maybe have a specific technical focus or try to make the most impact in one sector, um, it's good to know what, what the audience here um, is interested in. Well, great. It looks like economic growth and higher education or education are top of the list. I think by virtue that we've come out of COVID, people are tired of talking about COVID, but a healthy society is needed to, to be the foundation that you build a healthy economy on. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to walk through all of the work that we do. Oh, please. But Jack, I can focus in a little bit on economic growth and education and hopefully talk through a few opportunities with you. And we have Kiki in the audience who can stay behind and maybe talk to some of you later about some of our interesting scholarship support programs that USAID uh, supports in our efforts. Yeah, so let's start with inclusive economic growth and education, and then we'll move into the environment sector. I think, what was the third most popular one? Democratic uh, resilience and governance, and then we'll end with health. So go All right, for it. So, so Indonesia has gone through transformative growth in 20 years. Uh, you all are probably around 20 years old, so you probably don't remember... Uh, what it was like in the Reformasi period. Those older folks in the audience know what I'm talking about. Indonesia was at a different place. It was transitioning from a dictatorship to a democracy, and the economy was really starting to take off in a positive direction. In the last 20 years, the economy's grown from a few hundred million, a billion dollars to over $1.6 trillion uh, size of the economy. And over that time, that economic growth has helped a lot of sectors of society come out of poverty. But Indonesia is not done yet. So USAID remains engaged uh, in the economic growth and higher education area. Some of the things that we focus in on are women empowerment and women entrepreneurs. And in that space, we've trained more than 15,000 uh, female, young female entrepreneurs. Uh, we've provided seed funding to more than 850 women entrepreneurs and people with disabilities. And in fact, uh, I get to visit some of our young entrepreneurs out in the field. And I was in Blitar. Anybody been to Blitar? Blitar is beautiful. Uh, it has a fantastic uh, mayor, Ibu Rini. Uh, and there's a program there that her uh, uh, district supports working with people with disabilities. And I recently bought a batik from a young woman who uh, is a beneficiary of that program, and I got to wear it at the U.S. Embassy Fourth of July party in order to try to promote uh, the fact that people with disabilities can be entrepreneurs and can make products that are, you know, solid and sound and can turn a profit for those entrepreneurs. I also had a fantastic chance to meet with uh, somebody you may all have heard of. Her, her name is Putri Ariani. Anybody heard her? She's one of my favorite young Indonesians out there. She's a young blind woman who also won the golden buzzer on America's Got Talent. And I, I got to see her sing the Indonesian national anthem at the 4th of July party, wearing my beautiful batik from uh, Puji, is the young woman from Blitar that I bought the batik from. Anyway, that's one of the, the types of projects we support in economic growth. In higher education, USAID used to send hundreds of Indonesians to the United States on scholarship programs. But as economic growth has happened all over Indonesia and the government has grown, they created a fund. Does anybody know what that fund is called for scholarships? LPDP, LPDP. So Indonesian government has a fund that allows young people and not so young people across Indonesia to study here or to travel overseas and 
uh, upskill or, or get a higher education degree. And so USAID has a few programs that work with LPDP and other ministries to ensure that young Indonesians have opportunities to travel and study, of course, in the United States of America, which is what we're looking uh, for doing. And if I may say so myself, there's a current beneficiary of some USAID higher education programs uh, that's pretty important to Indonesia. Uh, the Minister of Finance used to run a USAID program at Georgia State University for economists like Olivia. Uh, and so we want to do more of that, and we're working with LPDP and Ministry of Education, Ministry of Religious Affairs, in order to send more Indonesians to the United States to have opportunities like Ibu Sri Mulyani. Amazing. Thanks for that overview, Jeff. Let's move to the next sector, the environment sector, which I think was number two in popularity here. So the environment sector for USAID is, is vast. We cover a lot of ground. We cover water and sanitation. We cover clean energy. You may have heard of the Just Energy Transition Partnership, which is something that US government, along with Japan and, and other international actors, support Indonesia making a transition from carbon-based energy production to uh, renewable energy production. And USAID has worked in this space for a long time, actually, for more than 12 years. This is a project that we supported uh, in South Sulawesi that is a wind power plant that we helped in the design and standing up uh, of this project. Uh, we also, of course, work on uh, conservation, on forest, uh, sustainable forest management, and climate change adaptation. There I am uh, with the ambassador, with my boss, and with the minister uh, we, where we had just signed this big agreement that's going to focus on supporting the FOLU net sink operational plan that is Indonesia's strategy in the, the forest and other land use space. Uh, on water and sanitation, this is uh, uh, me visiting a clean water project. Uh, oh, I'm gonna, not going to remember exactly where I was. You remember where this picture was taken? I don't remember. I think it's in uh, Magalang. Thank you. Oh, God. You can read that? I can't read it. It's in Magalang, and this is a small community where they can drink water from the tap. How many people here can drink water from your tap in Jakarta? I mean, you could drink it, but you might have to go to the emergency room. But if you drink water in this small community in Magalang, you can drink it because there's actually a hydro doser that was a project of a student at the Jakarta Intercultural School while in school. Makes me feel like I'm not working hard enough. Uh, he built this hydro doser that provides clean drinking water to the people in this small community. These are the types of projects that USAID works on to make sure that everyone in Indonesia has access to clean water and safe sanitation systems. Uh, and so the last thing that we work on, I just mentioned previously that I had gone to Lemukutan, and in Lemukutan I did some diving at a marine protected area. We have programs that focus on sustainable fishing and marine conservation together in areas uh, in the they're called the fishing areas 711 and 7115. It's between uh, Papua and uh, uh, Manado and between West Kalimantan, Rio Islands, and Banka Belitung. That's the areas we're working on, marine conservation and sustainable fisheries. Uh, over time, we've been able to capture or reduce 76 million metric tons of emissions. That's like 13 million cars not on the road. We've been able to reduce these emissions through a variety of different projects like renewable energy. We've mobilized $2 billion. Like I said, USAID spends a certain amount of our resources, but we're able to leverage those resources for sustainable energy uh, interventions in Indonesia. And we've been able to protect, uh, put under protected management more than 12 million hectares of land in Indonesia over time. And of course, increased safe water and drinking, safe drinking water and sanitation for more than 7 million Indonesians over the last 15 years, right? It's quite impressive how expansive the environment portfolio is at USAID. Um, they've got their hands in a little bit of everything. All right, so that was the environment sector. Let's move on to the democratic resilience and governance sector. So all societies need a basis to operate. And in Indonesia, after the Reformasi, democracy came to be that operating system for the country. And Indonesia is the fourth largest country on earth and the third largest democracy. Its democracy is really important, of course, for all of you and all folks in Indonesia, but also as an example for other countries around the world to follow. 
And so USAID over time has worked on ensuring that Indonesian democracy is one, very Indonesian, and that it gets uh, managed and rolled out in a way that it increases the provision of services to Indonesian citizens across the country. So we've worked quite a bit on civil society strengthening. We've worked quite a bit on ensuring that decentralization happens and that resources get sent from the central government closer to where they're needed, service provision at the local level. And we've also worked on countering violent extremism and, of course, human rights work. Um, you know, important things that you read about in the newspaper, we've supported KPK and the fight against corruption. Uh, we support free and open media and social media specifically recently, ensuring that we can fight uh, disinformation and misinformation. We work on ensuring that the Supreme Court can process criminal cases quickly. Uh, and of course, we want to prevent corruption and make sure that local governance, governments and national governments are planning for development in a way that leads to the improvement of service provision and development indicators in communities across the country. Awesome, thank you. And finally, let's give a quick overview of the health sector. So the health sector is actually the one that USAID has been consistently involved with since 1961 in Indonesia. Uh, it is our largest program. We spend about half of our budget every year in the health space. And of course, during COVID, we were extremely active in ensuring that all Indonesians had the right information, had vaccines, access to vaccines in support of the government of Indonesia. Uh, we currently are supporting the transformation that is happening at the Ministry of Health. There's a new omnibus health law that recently passed, and we want to ensure that the minister and his team can have an impact with these transformations that are happening at the Ministry of Health. One of those transformations is a digital transformation. How many of you have used Peduli Lindungi? We used to have to use them to get into the mall, right? Well, the ministry is taking Peduli Lindungi and transforming it into a new app called Satu uh, Sehat, and USAID is supporting that transformation. Tuberculosis. Indonesia is a huge, has a huge tuberculosis burden. Almost 900,000 new cases a year happen in Indonesia, and unfortunately, for many years, those cases have gone undetected and untreated. It's sad because tuberculosis is a treatable and preventable and curable disease that kills hundreds of people each day in Indonesia. 250 people a day die from tuberculosis, a disease that's curable and preventable. So USAID is actively involved with the Ministry of Health and uh, local uh, entities across the country to fight tuberculosis. In fact, my boss came and got to announce a new USAID project focused on uh, tuberculosis called Bebas TB. We'll see how that pans out over the next few years. Of course, uh, another problem in Indonesia, the economy has grown, but the quality of service provision in the healthcare space to Indonesians lags behind especially as it pertains to mothers and infant babies. And in Indonesia, there are still about 15,000 mothers and 75,000 newborns per year that die because they're not getting the care and support needed in the prenatal and postnatal uh, you know, engagements. And so USAID remains active in supporting the Ministry of Health, specifically in the primary health care arena to ensure that that Indonesian mothers and infants are getting the care and services they need. Uh, and we work across Indonesia with these initiatives. Uh, and hopefully, if any of you are interested in the healthcare industry, there's a lot of opportunity for future employment in healthcare in Indonesia. Great. So those are the, that was like a crazy fast uh, overview of USAID Indonesia sectors. And of course, there's so much more that is done, um, but we only have an hour today to talk to you about it. So hopefully you've got some good questions coming from that overview of our portfolio. Um, now that you have a great understanding of USAID Indonesia, its history, how it works here in Indonesia, and what it does, let's move on to something a little more personal. Mm -hmm. I think I also am very interested to hear about Bak Jeff's life his story, uh, how he came to be the mission director, the leader of USAID Indonesia. You know, um, careers are not always a linear path. They can be winding. You might have some 
interesting experiences that inevitably or surprisingly will take you in a totally different direction. And since many of you are just at the start of your careers, um, it might be a nice way to, to see how, how your careers might go in the future. So let's go and start in Detroit, Michigan. Does anybody know what's Detroit famous for? Football? Football? Yeah. The Detroit Lions, but they're a bad team. The Detroit Pistons are a good, or used to be a good team. What else? Eminem. I actually grew up on the road Eight Mile, which is made famous by Eminem's movie called Eight Mile. What else? Cars, Motown, the Motor City, and of course Eminem and music. There was music before Eminem that made Detroit famous. Anybody remember, know any of those artists, the Motown artists? <sighs> you may have heard of a few. The Jackson Five, Michael Jackson's family band was a Motown band. Aretha Franklin, Although she was not on Motown Records, she's pretty famous, or was. Uh, Stevie Wonder, you've heard that name? These are all Motown artists from the 60s, 70s, and 80s that uh, brought Detroit to fame in addition to the automobile. I grew up in Detroit, and I used to live in a building just off the, the picture there to the left. So Michigan State University. I am a Michigan State Spartan. If you get a chance to go to the United States to study, it's very important that you know about your mascot and your sports teams at your university. So I went to Michigan State. Uh, I studied political economy there. Uh, and I spent a lot of time uh, enjoying the springtime and huddling I I inside in the wintertime because it gets very cold there. So that's Michigan State. While I was at Michigan State, I took the opportunity to do an overseas study program in Seville, Spain. Uh, in 1992, Seville, Spain was pretty cool that year because of a couple things. It was the year of the Barcelona Olympics, and it was also the year of the World's Fair, uh, which is a cool opportunity to meet people from all over the world in one kind of space. And so I was there in 1992. I loved Spain so much I wanted to stay forever. So when I was 22, I graduated from college and I opened a bar on the beach in Rota, Spain, called Route 66. Does anybody know what Route 66 is? It's a highway that runs from Chicago to LA. It's also a song made famous by Nat King Cole, later on by Depeche Mode and others. Anyways, I opened a bar and as many entrepreneurial endeavors Sometimes things don't go 100% as planned. It only lasted one season, but it, the bar remains. It's just no longer my bar, uh, but that was in 1992. Uh, after uh, Spain, I moved back to Detroit, and I was a salesman in Detroit for a while and realized that wasn't my calling. I had lived in Spain. I had learned to speak Spanish, uh, and I was in Detroit near my parents, and I wanted to see the world again. And I thought maybe graduate school is the right call, so I ended up going out to Monterey, California, to a place called the Monterey Institute of International Studies, where I got a master's degree in international policy studies. And I also uh, was able to meet returned Peace Corps volunteers that had gone overseas, become volunteers living in villages across the world. Uh, and they encouraged me to take my excessive amount of student loans, which that's an American thing. You guys probably don't need to worry too much about that. Uh, and I joined the Peace Corps, and I lived there. So that mountain is called Mount Ilimani, and it's 6,400 meters above sea level. And the mountain face that you see, and all the communities on this side of the mountain in front of us, there are 98 of them, belong to the, uh, the, the Kabupaten, the district that I worked in with a Bupati, a local mayor. Uh, and that canyon there is called the Chuakeri Canyon, uh, and it's a beautiful, small example of what the Grand Canyon looks like, but very small compared to the Grand Canyon. I lived just at the bottom there in a town that was a 1,000 people called Palca, La Paz, Bolivia. And I worked on municipal development, strengthening local governance with a mayor's office in a small town. It was a lot of fun. I learned a lot of things. I got to learn an indigenous language called Aymara. But most importantly for my career, I got to learn what 
life was like in a rural, impoverished, impoverished setting and learned quite a bit about my view of what poverty was and what poverty really is and what poverty really isn't. Because while I would look at someone's humble house and think in my own Western way about, oh my goodness, they use a latrine, they don't have a bathroom, they don't have a shower, they're cooking over an open fire, but then they would have 10 cows and 15 sheep and three llama and 25 guinea pig. You, who knows what a guinea pig is? In Bolivia, it's dinner. Yeah. Anyways, you learn the difference between material possessions and assets and what poverty really is all about and what it isn't about and how people in those environments just need support and encouragement and they can see their, their own personal growth uh, same way as others. Anyway, I left... I left Bolivia and I went here, which is Tegucigalpa, Honduras, uh, where luckily I was able to work for the Peace Corps again and I met my wife. And while living in Honduras, our daughter was born. So I lived five years in Honduras working for the Peace Corps. And then I decided to join USAID as a foreign service officer. And my first post was the Dominican Republic. As you can imagine, I spent a lot of time in Spain, Bolivia, Honduras, and now the Dominican Republic. I speak Spanish much better than I speak Bahasa. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I'm not doing this presentation in Bahasa. And then the next place I got to go with USAID is this place, Machu Picchu. If you ever get a chance, this is an iconic place on earth to go visit the ruins of Machu Picchu, a fabulous place. And by the way, Indonesia has a lot of these iconic locations. How many people have been to Padar Island? Padar Island is an iconic piece of, the best picture in Peru is this one. One of the best pictures, one of the best in Indonesia is Padar Island. So please go to Komodo and Padar Island when you get a chance. After Peru, I was sent to Kabul, Afghanistan in the middle of the war. Uh, and I worked on trying to support development progress in a very challenging environment in Kabul. I ended up serving twice in Afghanistan from 2014 to 2015. And again, as deputy mission director, 2017 to 2020, I left right as, as COVID was beginning to take hold across the world. After uh, Afghanistan, I transitioned to get another master's degree at this place called the National War College, which is part of the US military, and it provides higher education for people on the rise in their career. What's interesting about this place is that it also invites foreign military uh, members to study there. While I was there, I studied with a guy named Oka, who is an admiral in the Indonesian Navy and is currently the defense attache in Australia for the Indonesian government. But this place is also famous because one of your most important ministers is a graduate from this uh, university, and his name is Minister Lahut. He's a graduate from the National War College. Next one. Oh, and then I made it to Indonesia. That's me in Komodo Island. That is one huge Komodo dragon. You have to be very careful with them. If I may just say a couple things about it being in Indonesia. I've been here for a year and a half, and I love Indonesia. If you're interested in social media stuff and you want to get a laugh, you can look up hashtag Pak Jeff or USAID Indonesia on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and eventually, or X, whatever it's called now, and eventually Thread will be on Thread. Uh, and you can watch videos of me as I visit interesting places, and not just me, as our team visits interesting places and visits our prog projects across the country. Clearly, because I'm short and round, I like to eat. So a lot of the videos are what we call food diplomacy, and I eat food everywhere I go, try different things, uh, and it's a lot of fun. I also, one of the things I love about Indonesia is I don't have to wear suits here. In every other place I went to, I had to wear a suit every day to work, and I much prefer the batik, this is a new one. I've been here 19 months, and I have more than 19 batiks, which means that in the next two years, I might end up with close to 40 or 50 total batiks, which is a lot. Nobody should have 40 or 50 shirts, period. Anyways, this one is a tunun trozo that I'm wearing today, which is a weaving instead of a batik made with wax and painting, and it's from the Kabupaten Japara in central Java. Uh, and it's one that these are made all over Indonesia. Sumatra, Bali, and Sulawesi all make these tanun troso batiks. Uh, I, I like seeing young Indonesians wearing batiks because I think it's important for your 
cultural awareness to feel the pride of wearing a batik. And trust me, it's better than wearing a suit. All right, I'm going to stop there and turn it back over to Olivia. Thank you for that amazing story of your life. I hope all of you are thinking about questions for Bak Jeff. If you have questions about USAID as an institution, please ask those, but also feel free to ask him about how he got to different places, his journey, um, the sort of his, his emotional journey through his career. Anything you want, we'll have a Q&A session quickly. But before we jump into the Q&A session, uh, I think Buck Jeff has a pitch to make to you all about potentially coming to work at USAID Indonesia in the future. So every, every summer, the U.S. Embassy has an internship program, and we bring in a lot of interns. I think USAID has nine interns this summer uh, from Indonesian universities. Uh, and they're doing great things. We have a few. Who of our interns that are here today? Arthur and others. Yeah, we have a few. Uh, they're available if you have questions about what we do at the U.S. Embassy in the summertime. But also, USAID, we currently have 133 staff. 103 are local staff, meaning they're Indonesian. And we have about 2,000 Indonesians that work for us in our projects in Jakarta and all over the country. And so I encourage you, if you're looking for work, to look at USAID and the U.S. Embassy as a, a possibility. And, and for those of you who are university students, I know the university you go to is probably pretty good in English, and so we're definitely looking for students with strong English skills, but not exclusively. All right? Uh, we have a fantastic team. That's my boss. You can see my bald head poking out behind him. Uh, and that's our USAID uh, Indonesia team. We have a wonderful staff that's inclusive, that's diverse, that's reflective of Indonesia, that's positive, uh, and it's really a fantastic place to work, and not just at USAID, but also with all of our partners in the field. Amazing. So hopefully everyone here is now thinking a little bit about potentially coming to work with and partner with USAID Indonesia. All right, thanks so much to everyone for your attention thus far. Now I think to the most exciting part, after Jeff's life story, of course, is going to be the Q&A session. So I'd like to open it up to all of you if you have any burning questions about USAID, about Jeff's life, about career, feel free. All right, let's take one from the live audience. Uh, yes, please, ma'am. Hello, Pak Jeff. My name is Rini. I was studying international relations in Universitas Gajah Mada, Jogja. So I went here a lot of times. I'm trying to learn from a lot of people also. So today, is, um, I'm so exciting since you tell a lot of your stories. But the thing that I really want to ask, I have a dream to be all around the world like a lot of times. But yeah, the dreams not come through yet. Not yet. Yeah, hopefully soon it will come through. And the things I want to ask is, what is the best thing? What is the best moment and the best message that you get since you live all over the world? You move from part to part, and do you have any emotional bonding in any places? And then you think, so is it every every place is the same? It's just big to ask how we enjoy it, or do you have any positive message from living place to place? No, I didn't. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sure, a couple things. When I was 15, I made it a life goal that I would visit 50 countries by the time I turned 50. I'm more than 50. I won't tell you how much more, but I'm more than 50 now, and I didn't make it. Does that mean I failed? No, because it's not necessarily the destination, it's the journey. That's a great saying. And a lot of those famous sayings are trite and cheesy, but they're also true. And so make a goal and try to get there. And the pathway to get there is going to be a lot of fun. And along that path, there'll be lots of inflection points or decision points that will lead you in a new direction that you never expected. And sometimes you just say yes. When, when I was 16, I had a blind Uncle Lenny. He had retinitis pigmentosa as a kid. He was 65 blind. He was a widower. His wife has passed away. He wanted to see the world. So he invited me on my first trip overseas to England, Scotland, and Wales. And Uncle Lenny asked me to be his eyes. And so I traveled with him on and off a bus for, for two weeks. But I got to see something outside of Detroit for the first time in my life. And I think getting a passport and going overseas starts that journey. So you got to do that. And it's probably easier from Indonesia than it was in the 80s from Detroit. 
But once you get overseas, just keep going, right? Don't say no to opportunities. You know, I mentioned eating guinea pigs. Sometimes you say yes to things and you're surprised at the result, sometimes in a negative way, sometimes in a positive way, but it always makes a good story. And life is a lot of things, and it's certainly about collecting good stories across time and then sharing them with people that you meet. So I think for me, it's about saying yes, getting out there, uh, and making sure that you're willing to accept the cultures and differences in a positive way. If you start getting negative when you live an overseas life, it gets really difficult to keep going. And so you really got to focus in on the positive. So that's kind of my advice to you. All right? Is that helpful? Great. Yeah, thank you for that question. We're going to take a question from our online audience, and then we'll come back to the live audience. So we have Myrna on Twitter who would like to know, how do you overcome language barriers in Indonesia when working on a project, especially since there are so many languages in Indonesia? Uh, that's a very good question. And I used to think I was good at languages until I took Indonesian as a class. And unfortunately, I took it during COVID one-on-one -on -one with a computer screen and a teacher, and it was really hard at my advanced age to learn Bahasa Indonesian. But I think the good news in Indonesia is while there's lots of local languages, Bahasa Indonesian really unifies the country in a positive way. And I've really not gone to a place where everyone spoke enough Bahasa Indonesian to have conversations with each other. For me, I learned enough Bahasa to tell a joke or two, right? To break some ice, but I travel with a wonderful Indonesian a woman named Ibu Herlina, who is my translator. And without Ibu Herlina, I would be lost. Uh, she's exceptional, and she also puts up with me on the road, which is, you know, we both like to eat, so I think that's where we, we, we find common ground. Uh, but I think Indonesians, especially under the Panchasila, it's a country built on the, you know, the structure of it is all these interesting cultures across 17,000 islands with different religions and different histories and different ethnicities and, of course, different languages. And I think that's the richness of Indonesia that makes it stronger um, with challenges, right, over time. But I, I think that the language barrier is tough, but you can overcome it with understanding. Yeah, and I think that's also the importance of having our Indonesian staff with USAID as well, because they were obviously born and raised here. They have that local context and, of course, those Indonesian language skills. And our Indonesian staff do come from all over the country. They're not just from the Jakarta area. And so they have a breadth of experience and, and knowledge to, to build from. That's a very good point. Thanks yeah. for that. All right. How about another question from the live audience? Yes, sir. And please introduce yourself so we know where you're coming from. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so Jeff, uh, Ms. Olivia, my name is Gemma. I'm from uh, International Relations in UPH from the batch of 2020. Uh, I really appreciate the way you uh, present uh, USAID and how it works, it's substantively. Um, I wanted to ask uh, something about USAID. You know, I think it's a bit more substantive. I would like to ask, uh, has USAID ever helped develop Indonesian schools, for example, like building schools and also developing uh, their curriculum or syllabus, something like that? And a follow-up question, if I may. Uh, can I? Okay, thank you. And another part is, would USAID be able to be um, open to trilateral, trilateral re relations? So, for example, between Indonesia, America, and perhaps like Poland or something. Uh, if you can't uh, see it, because it has something to do with my thesis title. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you can answer. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Gemma, right? Yes, yes. Uh, so I'll start with the, the second question first. There's an organization called IndoAid, which is the Indonesian USAID, and it's still early in its development. A few years back, USAID actually had a program specifically to help IndoAid become the entity that it is becoming. Uh, and we are very interested in tri trilateral cooperation. Uh, we've been approached uh, by the government of Indonesia to talk about supporting women in, Indo in Afghanistan and working to provide potentially scholarships for Afghan women to study in Indonesia. Um, it's a bit of a challenge because of the Taliban being so oppressive and horrific towards the women in Afghanistan. Uh, 
we also are interested in supporting joint work in the Pacific, an area that uh, Indonesia is really interested in seeing develop further, of course, due to its location. So trilateral cooperation is really important. And we also work with our other like-minded friends and ally partners like the Brits, like the, the Kiwis, like the Aussies, co-funding projects together with the government of Indonesia. Not quite trilateral, but also working together to support projects here in Indonesia. Uh, education. In USAID Indonesia worked in the basic education space for a really long time. There was a program called Prioritas, uh, which focused on curriculum development, early grade reading and math for elementary school kids all across the country. Uh, but as Indonesia developed and built its own schools, and we used to build schools back in the day, but the capacity, the resources exist for the government of Indonesia to build its own schools. So we worked on the curriculum development. We produced uh, reading books uh, through lots of our local partners. And when that project got to a place where we felt Indonesia could take over that project, both the government and the private sector, we handed it off. And there's an organization called the Tonoto Foundation, uh, which is, I believe, part of the Tonoto Family Foundation that supports a lot of development work in Indonesia. They took over our project, Prioritas, and it's now called Pintar. Uh, and it's a project that does mentorship and training for teachers all over the country. It does early grade and early math uh, skill development. And it's really an ex a shining example of how development is supposed to work, where USAID does something, tests it out, sees if it works. When it does work, we scale it up a little bit, and then we hand it off to the government and private sector in Indonesia to move it forward. Uh, there's always a lot more work that can be done, but sometimes it's up to USAID to hand it off to others. Thank you for that question. We have a question from Instagram from Shamsul. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. Shamsul, Shamsul on Instagram. Uh, Shamsul wants to know, what are the biggest challenges that USA deals with regarding remote projects? And especially considering the size of Indonesia as a country, the geographic uh, breadth that uh, USAID covers, how do you deal with remote projects? I spend a lot of time at the airport, uh, and not just me, our entire team, and not just the USA team of 133 people, but the USA team of 2,000 people that are spread out all over the country. I was just in Pontianak, and I visited uh, projects there with the governor. We had seven different USA projects in the room. Each of them have people and offices in West Kalimantan that support our efforts. So we hire local people, we work with local government organizations, we work with local NGOs and CSOs, uh, civil society organizations, Organisasi Masyarakat Sipil, in the field, and we engage them because we need to hear from communities, we need to hear from governments uh, in order to make sure that our projects are hitting the mark, are doing the things that we set out to achieve. Uh, but it's a lot of it is travel. It is difficult. 17,000 islands. And, you know, to get to Jayapura, you're spending all night on a plane, and then you land in Jayapura, and then you got to get from there to Wamena, from Wamena to Manokwari. That's a week of effort just to go to, you know, a handful of events and meetings. So that's why I get some frequent flyer miles on Garuda, because I travel quite a bit. But yeah, you got to get out there, and you have to engage local communities, uh, local authorities, and really ensure that you're doing it also in local languages where necessary. Exactly. And so if you remember the slides we showed earlier about all of USAID Indonesia's partners, right? That's where all that partnership comes in because you can leverage all these different networks um, geographically dispersed across the country um, to help accomplish some of these development goals that we work on. All right, let's take another question from this side. Uh, yes, ma'am, in the back, all the way in the back. Okay, thank you for the presentation. Uh, hello, Pak Jeff. Hello. Hello, Mbak um, Olivia. Uh, I'm Zawa. I just graduated from our international relations at UPN Veteran Jakarta. Uh, I just want to ask about um, the project in USAID. Uh, as you just said, there is uh, summer interns, but uh, personally, I just graduated, so what I want to ask is, is there any possibility to be like you, to travel around the world, uh, working with USAID? So is there any project that help 
to increase the employment uh, for graduated students or people who hasn't have work in USID? Thank you. That's a very good question. And uh, it took me five years of applying to USAID before I finally got an interview. Uh, and the reason why, and I started in 1999 and I didn't get an offer for a job until 2004, uh, the reason being is you've got to gather experience. Uh, and, and it's tough. How do you get experience if you can't get a job to get that experience? It's a bit of a chicken or the egg, right? I think the key is being willing to be an intern, hopefully find, finding internships that pay money, and sometimes it's taking that job that's less than you want less than you think you want or that you should be getting paid or doing, but it's in the right organization. And I think where you can take a job in an organization that you want to work with, maybe for less money than you think you deserve, you start making your mark. And I'll give you an example. If there's an NGO, uh, you know, LSM, or a, a civil society organization that needs help, and you can survive with a low level of, you know, gaji, right, pay, salary, then do it, because that experience, the gaining of that experience is important to build your resume. Internships are one thing, maybe being the delivery person, or maybe being the secretary, or maybe being uh, the clerk, or volunteering on the weekends for an organization that interests you, a lot of that leads you to the job that you're looking for down the road. Um, I've been an intern many times, and each one of those jobs added to my resume. And I also think, you know, don't be shy. You need to get out there. You need to call people. You need to send your resume. You need to volunteer your time. You need to engage. And I think in your community where you live and in places that you go, you, you've got to just step out and put yourself out there. That's kind of my advice. USAID hires people all over the world. We're in 80 countries with missions. We have, I want to say, 6,500 local staff, meaning in the countries where we work, those are people that work directly in an embassy for USAID. And then we have tens of thousands more local staff across the world that work in our projects, whether they're HIV AIDS projects in Africa or, or civil society strengthening programs in Laos. I mean, we do work everywhere. And Indonesians oftentimes travel to other countries. A good friend of mine, Sam Tumiwa, is a former USAID employee here in Jakarta, and now he works for ADB in Manila and has traveled the world working for ADB, the Asian Development Bank. So you just gotta get in there and you gotta get, sometimes it takes that, you get, you take the first job to get the next job, right? Sometimes you take that job, it wasn't quite exactly what you wanted, but it helps you make that next step. So hope Perfect. that helps. Yeah, thank you for that question. That's actually a great question to wrap up our session with. Some career advice for you all as you look to embark on your careers, as you uh, look to graduate from university. Um, so just want to give a really big thank you to you all for taking the time out of your day to come and be here with us to learn about USAID. Uh, we hope you'll stay engaged with USAID Indonesia. We hope you'll come back to the At America venue for future events. Also, a big shout out and thank you to the At America team, the AV team, for, for putting on this uh, event for us. I'll pass it back to our e-guide to close out the event. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, Olivia Wynn. And of course, by Jeff, can we give a big round of applause to our moderator and speaker for today? Thank you. So everyone, if you want to keep updated for our amazing events here in Ad America, you can follow our social media. We have on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, AT America. And don't forget to stay tuned with us for the next session of our series, Meet the U.S. Embassy. My name is Patricia Elizabeth, and see you on the next Ad America events. Bye!